shall he lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, trumpet call obey, for to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. greatest God Almighty, as we partake of this simple wafer, symbolizing your body, may we always remember the sacrifice on our behalf. We thank you, Father, for your only begotten. We pray that we live every day in gratitude, in gratitude and obedience to him. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. After the same manner, also he took the cup, which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this, ye, as oft as we drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Father, as we open this small container, always remember that it's the fruit of the vine, symbolizing your blood, 
cannot be retrieved, lest it be pierced and crushed. Father, in the blood there is life. We thank you, Lord, that it's by the blood of Jesus that our sins are forgiven, and we have eternal life with you forever and ever. Amen. Let us drink the cup together on our knees. Let us drink the cup together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Gentlemen, you're dismissed back to your families. We have been doing the Lord's Supper for a while now. Before the message, and I think it appropriate to get our hearts correct before going to the Lord in worship. Amen. I am grateful for all the men that helped tonight and uh, Miss Kim who, who set the elements up and all of you in attendance. Won't you bow with me as we seek the Lord's face on the rest of our worship this evening. Father in heaven, greatest God almighty, I lift up each and every person here, every man and woman, boy and girl. As we have partaken in these elements in remembrance of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that we look into your word tonight and we look at the vine and in perspective ourselves in him. We love you, Lord, and we pray that uh, you will help us to be more like your son. Make us fruitful, Father, please. In Jesus' precious name, all of God's people said, amen and amen. Well, if you'll turn with me to John chapter 15. This will be a rather short message. I, I know I say that often and end up going over. But really, uh, it's a very simple and short message because this name of Jesus, uh, this title, this proclamation, comes, uh, it is the last of seven claims to divinity, the last of the seven great I am statements. And Jesus claims and states emphatically, that he is the vine, the true vine. He says in John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Now, to say he is the true vine implies that there might have been or is a false vine. Israel, Israel at one time, was referred to throughout Scripture as a vine. Uh, and even as they were a vine, or referred to as a vine, they were a vine of sorts, a foreshadow, if you will. Israel being the model of the imperfect son. Jesus being the perfect who has now come, and the perfect son is the true vine. The true vine in whom we find all of our sustenance. We find all of our life. We find, indeed, eternal life. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that, every branch that, beareth, fruit, that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, that's an interesting word there, that he purges that which does bring fr fruit. He says, every branch that doesn't bring fruit, what does he do? He takes it away. But then he says, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. You know, pruning is a, uh, pruning is a biblical concept. Uh, we, we bought a home here recently, and it, it's got foliage like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I have killed more plants and more, more lawns than you can shake a stick at. They probably ought to put me away uh, because I've killed so much foliage in the desert here in Las Vegas. Uh, but what I have learned is this summer, there's the plants that the people, the, the previous owner 
planted in our backyard, they're hardy. They chose plants that would do well in the desert because every time I would go back to prune them, they started to grow even more wild. As a matter of fact, my daughter was over just the other night. And I was pruning these uh, uh, parts of this bush that are alongside a brick wall. That man, it was like it was like tentacles of an octopus. I, I had to walk in the rocks to get around it. And I thought this is the wildest thing I've ever seen. But Austin, I had pruned it, and because I had pruned it, it began to grow more. Pruning, pruning is a biblical concept. But God prunes for one purpose, and that is that it might become more fruitful. But he does take that which does not bear fruit, and he gets rid of it. He says uh, in verse 3, Now ye, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye accept, no more can ye accept ye abide in me. He says again, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. Ye that abide in me, and I in him, the same shall bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Ye can do nothing. I was talking with a friend via text a couple nights ago. And he was lamenting over some issues. And he goes, well, at least you have saved many souls. My friends, I've never saved a single soul. Can't save a soul. Wouldn't want to save a soul. Why? Because I'm a soul myself. If I could save a soul, they'd be lost again. Ah, but see, the souls that God saves. Ah, but I have introduced many to the Savior. I have introduced many to the Savior. But you know, I've only introduced them to the one that I have. I've only introduced them and welcomed them and invited them in to the one who I reside in. The one whom I live in. The one who I abide in. And by the way, the one who I demand to be fruitful of. I learned from this pulpit. This isn't some sort of uh, overdramatic, sophomoric play. It's the truth. I learned from this pulpit right here. The only thing the Christian has a right to demand of God is to be fruitful. And the day that I surrendered my life to God, I demanded he make me fruitful. I want to see the kingdom come. I want to see the kingdom expanded. I don't want necessarily to see the church grow except that God grow her. I'm not interested in being the pastor of a mega church, but I would love to fellowship with some mega Christians. And in fellowshipping with mega Christians, that means some of the baby Christians got to get potty trained. Got to grow up. Got to get out of high school. Got to move on to, to higher education, if you will. You must mature. Because if you don't mature, well, it's... It's, it's not good. And what happens is you become stagnant. And stagnant things cannot thrive. Stagnant things die. Fact of the matter is, we've got a pond out back now. We, we've really moved up, Mike. And I'm constantly throwing bleach and Clorox and anything I can in that pond. You know why? Because stagnant things stank. No, we're constantly cleansing it. We're constantly cleaning it. We're constantly, my wife's always out there with the net, getting everything out of it. Why? Because if we're not filtering it, if we're not making sure that it's constantly running, if we're not always attending to it, it will stagnate. It will stink. Christians, we must, we must continue to move forward in our walk with Christ. We must continue to abide in him. And in doing so, that is a part of our self-sanctification in obeying his commands, in loving him and loving one another. Let's continue on. He says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same shall bringeth forth much fruit. I say amen to that. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abideth not in me, 
That's a man or a woman, by the way. He is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, I, I, we could sit here all night and, and banty back and forth as to whether or not this means you can lose your salvation. Here's what I would say. If you can lose your salvation, you never really had it to begin with. So these ones that uh, are not fruitful, these ones that are not bearing fruit, these ones that are not growing, they might well, they might well be fake. But, uh, my mom, she used to, she, well, she's, she's got the green thumb in the family. We used to live in, uh, over here off of Stewart and Lamb, lived there for years. And she grew bulbs, and she grew all, lilies, and she grew all this stuff out there. And every now and again, she'd say, Scotty, look at that sucker out there. And I'd look, i go, I don't see anybody. She goes, no, the sucker plant. I go, sucker plant? She goes, yeah, that thing that's growing alongside of my roses. I go, what do you mean? She goes, you see that thing out there looks just like my rose, but it hasn't bloomed yet? I go, Mom, that's just a bud. She goes, no, that's a sucker plant. That's fake. See, what it does is it gloms on to the root, it gloms on to the bulb, it gloms on alongside. And it grows alongside and it sucks the nutrients out from that which is real. But it doesn't bear real fruit. What it really does is it continues to suck the nutrients out of that which is real, that which is substantial, that which was planted purposefully. It kills that which is real. Ah, but you know what she would do? She would say, that's not a problem. She would go out there and just snip that right off, man. Snip that right off and then fertilize the rest of her roses. And, uh, you know, I love roses. They're like weeds. They do grow well. Well, we continue on. He says, uh, so uh, are we clear on that? If you can lose your salvation, you probably never had it. And so it don't get surprised if, if people in the church, they go away. You know, if they went out from among us, they were probably never part of us anyway. Never, I, I don't really sweat that. You know, I, I think to myself, well, were they a part of us, Lord? If they were a part of us, they would abide with us and we with you and us together. Forbearing one another in love. Ah, there's the key. We forbear one another in love. Why? Does not God forbear us? He forbears us in love. Tolerating what? Not tolerating sin. Forgiving sin. Forgiving sin. And expecting us to walk holy with him. If you abide in me, verse 7... If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. We say, well, praise God, I finally found my Aladdin's lamp in the Bible. I can ask God whatever I want, and he'll give it to me. Oh, but you see, it comes with a stipulation. It says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. So you see, he says, he wants you to be fruitful. So you can ask to be fruitful, and he'll make you fruitful. Yeah, he doesn't say that he'll give you a million dollars, so you can ask by his words, and you, he'll give you a million dollars. His words are what dictate our prayers. Some have said, uh, of smarter men than me have said, our prayers are like thanking God's thoughts back to him. Our prayers are like thanking God's thoughts back to him. Sometimes even praying his word back to him. Not in some sort of uh, esoteric witchcraft-like spell, but instead being in one accord with God and in the spirit. Our spirit are, is one with his. And as we pray in his will, we have when we know we have what we've asked for. Does that make sense to you? We continue to read. He says... Uh, you ha if you ask, uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall have what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my father glorified. What? That ye bear much fruit. It's bookended by what? Bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. I was so excited Sunday. Sunday, what did we do? We sat here. For, I mean, I, I got done almost exactly at noon. Then we sat here for 10, 15 minutes afterwards as person after person came forward. And I plucked counselor after counselor up. And we had guests here from far and near. And all of them remained patient. Why? Well, I explained it to them, folks. I know you're probably hungry. You want to go home. But we all came here to worship. But we live for times like this. We live to be fruitful. 
We, God has a plan and a purpose for us all, but for the church especially, to be fruitful, to go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Ray was baptized. Michael was baptized. And Lord willing, will baptize another half dozen more this coming weekend. And why not two dozen next weekend? And why not four dozen the week after that? We must learn to pray expectantly and ask God, make us fruitful. You are the vine. We are the branches. Lord, grow grapes like, es like the grapes of escrow. Get them real nice, fat, and juicy. Send them to us. Make us fruitful, Father God. Please, I want that mountain, Lord. Give me that mountain. We are, by the way, guys, I don't know if you know this. We're not on the other side of the Jordan anymore. We, we are in the promised land now. As we are in the promised land, we must claim it. We must claim it. And by the way, being in the promised land doesn't mean that there won't be skirmishes or battles. We must claim it and we must keep it. And are you ready for this? Gain territory. Gain territory. Hence, seeking the kingdom first. Seeking the kingdom first. That's one by one. W-O-N-O-N-E. Even if that means inviting them to church, that was for free. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. How, how did Jesus love his disciples? You know how excited I was a second ago? When they told me there was somebody in the back that hadn't gotten their, their element yet. For those of you on the radio, we did Lord's Supper tonight. And I thought, okay, great, I get a chance to serve. Because really, the, the picture is, if you guys haven't noticed, is that the men, they come and they serve the church. And then I get up and I serve the men. And then Pastor gets up, Pastor Roger gets up and he serves me. And then I get up and we all partake and sing together. But when I got up to serve the men, after I'd served all the men, there was a few that had just come in. And I got to serve somebody else. Amen. I got to love somebody else. See, he loved us by serving us. He says, love one another as I have loved you. And my love will be in you. And they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. These men, they rush across town Wednesday nights. Rico, Zach, Austin, Jeff, all of the men, they rushed across. Andrew comes all the way from Timbuktu. Larry, they come across. Uh, Daryl Love, every Wednesday night, they run here to serve you. Why? Well, first and foremost, they love their Lord. Secondly, they love you. They abide in him. His word abides in them. And they serve. Nothing thrills my heart more than to be able to serve. My friends, this is an awesome commandment. He says, these things I have spoken to you. I'm sorry, let's go back to verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, these things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. What was the last time you thought about Jesus' joy? <laughs> you know me. You know how you are. I know me. I'm always thinking about how I can get rid of the pain in my hip. I said, well, Lord, maybe another 800 milligrams of a leaf tonight. We'll see how that goes. We'll do, uh, hey, hey, Lord, how about, how about the, uh, the spa tonight? Maybe we'll rub some salve on it too. When's the last time we thought about the joy of Jesus? He says that my joy might be in you. What is it that brings Jesus joy? Oh, I tell you what brings Jesus, Jesus joy. Look to your right and look to your left. But the, for the joy that was set before him, he became obedient even unto the cross. What was that joy? I say it all the time. It was mankind. It was the redemption of sinners. It was the resurrection of the repentant. 
the born again, the regenerate. People. People. Let this joy be in you. He says, um, I'm sorry, I lost my life. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy remain in you. And that your joy might be full. Now, no, I'm not talking about happiness. Or oh, you have the right to pursue happiness. And if you go right ahead and do that, it's going to be a lifelong pursuit. And you may or may not catch it. It's very futile. You can have it today, it'll be gone tomorrow. Happiness is a fluttering and fleeting thing. Ah, but joy is deep. I got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. That comes from in here. I mean, I could be happy one minute, sad the next. Judy's always telling me, you'll be happy and mad in the same pants you came in. in. I don't know what that means. She's from Texas. I pray for her. Joy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Listen to me, my friends. Jesus is talking to you today. You who abide in him of the vine. He says that your joy might be full. This is my commandment. This is Jesus' commandment. That ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life. For his friends. Ye are my friends if ye, de if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, Jesus says, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. It's interesting to me. That every single letter and disciple, apostle, calls themselves bond servants to Christ. Although he said, you're no longer servants to me. But they claim to be bond servants. Do you know why? The, the term bond servant is, is, is different than servant or slave. A bond servant was one that was set free set free, but gave themselves back to their master. It was signified oftentimes by the wearing of one ring in, in, in one of the ears. They gave themselves back to their master. The one who said, I am no longer a master to you, but I am your friend. I am a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And they said, we give ourselves wholly to you, master. To you, Lord. To you, God. How about you tonight? Have you given yourself wholly to him? This summer, we have added one other call to our three traditional calls, if you will. And that is to give your life to church vocation. Give your life to preach and teach the gospel. Give your life to evangelism. Give your life to missions or to the pastorate. Uh, if you abide in him, I can tell you this. If his word abides in you and you ask him to make you fruitful, my friends, you need not worry about that. You just scatter the seed liberally and long and God will bring forth the excess.